Good day, everyone. Today, guys, we're going to discuss a controversial case wherein a nurse working in a nursing home with a ratio of one nurse versus 39 patients. And during her shift, one of the patients fell. And this patient is actually related to someone related to the government, related to former President Trump. So this is a big controversial thing here. When he fell, the patient died after a few hours before the end of the shift or during at the end of the shift. So that's basically the case for Nurse Kristen Ganey. So we will discuss what happened here and we'll discuss few topics and we're in, I think you should be interested or you should want to hear this because a uh, few things are really different working in the medical surgical field versus in a nursing home, which I actually just learned about few things about the nursing home rulings from uh, nurses who are working in actual uh, settings. So for me, it was quite shocking to learn some of those things. So I'm sure you guys would like to hear this also. Especially for those foreign nurses who wants to come here to the United States without a background for bedside experience. Because most of you guys will end up working in a nursing home. Yes. And you guys are going to have the same similar uh, scenario where you'll be taking patients with like a 1 is to 20, 1 is to 30, to 50 or 60. And sometimes you will be on your own. So let's discuss and look what really happened during this day. This information is brought to you by the CMS report done in 2018. And also, I got some information coming from nurses who actually works in a nursing home setting. Uh, because like I said, it's quite different working in a nursing home setting versus in a medical surgical field. Hearing their thoughts and comments about uh, the scenario really opened up my mind about these things. It was quite a shocking uh, experience for me because I never thought that they have those kind of ruling. Uh, one example is the right to fall. So, I never heard of that. So uh, let's discuss, okay? Let's start. The scenario is uh, one LPN, which is Nurse Kristen Ganey. LPN means a licensed practical nurse. So she's not an RN, but an LPN. Uh, she has 39 patients, but she has two CNAs that to help her. So basically, there's three of them versus 39 patients. So it's not that bad. Uh, versus the one I posted in the fora wherein she has like one patient versus 260 all by herself. So, so that's really a very different thing. Okay. So here the patient was admitted on April 9 with diagnosis including hypertension, cerebral vascular accident or CVA or stroke, and expressive aphasia, meaning abnormal uh, neurologic condition wherein the patient uh, language function is impaired. Most likely he couldn't express properly what he wanted to say. So sometimes he would think that he was saying it correctly, but uh, it turns out or comes out very differently wherein you wouldn't understand it. Also, the patient had a history wherein he fell in December 2017, meaning four months ago prior to the incident. Then on further review, uh, the record revealed approximately 9.45 p.m. on April 9, 2018 through 1.55 a.m. on April 12, a period of three days. The patient sustained four, four falls. Okay? Never in my lifetime as a nurse had I had a patient wherein he fell like four times in the span of a few days. I work in a medical surgical unit and I also work in a stroke unit where I have like maximum of 35 patients. I never have they fallen like few times in a row in few days. Uh, but that scenario happened in Singapore wherein they have a different ruling. And nursing home here in the United States have a pretty good reason for that why the patient actually fall or fell rather is because the patients in that facility has the right to fall. Yes right to fall so meaning you have the right to do whatever you want uh including fall uh, not falling in love but <laughs> falling flat on your face so you can do that because that is your right meaning as from the colleague who works in a nursing home uh, no restraints is allowed for this kind of patients restraints means no side drills yes side drills is considered a restraint in a nursing home setting no bed alarms then having a low bed is considered a restraint if uh, you're trying to do that for the patient so for me that's a really really different weird ruling for me an unsafe ruling so i don't know why these things are like uh they have that kind of right uh but it is what it is right but i'm not sure if with kristan gaini's uh, facility if that's the same ruling because like I said, different nursing facilities have different rulings. If I was one of the family members, I would not like my uh, father or mother to be admitted to this kind of place wherein they are allowed to fall freely without any restraints. But another thought coming from a nursing home staff, she said they have a consent for this. If the family wants a consent that uh, side rules would to be put up, they have to get a written consent. Yes, so they have a countermeasures for this. And I think that should be it. 
especially for stroke patients because number one safety issue for them is definitely fall because most of them do have like a one-sided neglect and i've worked in a, a rehab setting before we're in a stroke rehab setting rather so i had like uh, 20 patients at, at the time and i see most of them trying to get up uh, feeling that they can walk but after they stand up they started falling down because they won't even know that there's a difference or there's something wrong with their body. That's how stroke works really. So you do have that uh, one-sided neglect. So it's really best to have these patients on, on a safer side by putting countermeasures that will help them prevent from falling down. So just additional comment about the side areas. For me, working in a medical surgical unit, medical surgical unit, okay? Uh, we are allowed to put the side areas and we are actually obligated to put at least two. Yeah, that's the normal thing we have to put in. But for patients who are a little bit um, not in their right mind, normally we put three. We are not allowed to put all four side rails without the consent coming from the family because raising all those four rails is considered a restraint. So you have to get a consent from the family or better ask the family to raise that four uh, side rail and document it properly. Then most of the time, if we don't have a consent, we raise the three side rails. And one of the openings, we have to leave it open for the what's this for the patient to have a space for him to technically not to be considered uh, being restrained on his bed and putting a bedside table on that uh, space is considered a restraint also so better that and never ever forget your bed alarm for these kind of patients so every time you come into the room turn on the bed alarm to make sure you can hear that the patient's trying to get out of the bed but those advices are coming from my senior nurses who train me here in the u.s so better ask from uh, your nurses or trainers or, or better look at the sops for your facilities so that would be a better answer for you anyway let's continue to the story on april 12 2018 at approximately 11 30 pm the resident or the patient was found lying on the floor near his bed so this is the fifth fall the patient had then per documentation, it is considered as an unwitnessed fall and the resident sustained a laceration on his forehead, right temple, like 1 cm by 1 cm and another one on his right shoulder and a knee area as a result of the fall. And also, it was noted that patient's night light had shattered as a result of the fall. Then both nursing aides and the licensed practical nurse transferred the resident into a wheelchair and brought the resident out to the nurse's station for staff to monitor him better. Yes, we do this often, even with the medical surgical unit. If uh, we have a patient who's really unruly and really has a high tendency for him to fall, we usually put them nearer or closer to the nurse's stations. Our uh, there's more nurses who will most likely see him that prevent him from falling down. Uh, especially during the times where in your staffing ratios is really, really stretched. Yes, there are some days where in, uh, you are like placed into a maximum and you really can't monitor them all together. Particularly if the patient's like uh, seated all the way to the end of the hallway. So it's best for them just to bring to the nurse's stations or closer to the nurse's stations. Then as a protocol from my friend's nursing home, she said that an unwitness fall and the nursing aide found the resident on the floor. Those CNAs or nursing aides are not allowed to touch the patient. Yep, they're not allowed not to bring the patient back to the bed and transfer all by themselves. They have to wait for the RN or the LPN for them to do the assessment first before safely transferring the patient. Okay, remember that. Uh, it does make sense, right? You have to make sure that the patient doesn't have any fractures or any uh, dislocation from the neck. So it's best to make sure that everything is uh, safe first before transferring. Then, the facility staff had contacted the resident's physician regarding the fall and initiated neurological checks, assessment of nerve functions, as per facility's policy. Then, Nurse Kristan had completed a neurological flow sheet. It is assessment for neurological brain slash function on the resident at 11.30 p.m. following the resident's fall. So that's the initial one. And continued through until April 13, 2018 at 7.20 a.m. Okay, so take note at the time for the 7.20. So that's the last time she was able to do a neurological assessment as per her notes. Based on the documentations and step that she took, uh, these are all proper way of handling a patient who had a fall, right? Uh, documentation wise, it is. Yes, documentation wise. But the question is, did she actually do all those documentations? So this is where our controversy lies. It's like uh, documentation versus what you actually have done. Because per continued review of the clinical record of the resident, revealed that the resident had been found unresponsive, unarousable at approximately 
7.15 a.m. Okay? Resident was subsequently pronounced dead at 7.17 a.m. However, the neurological evaluation form completed by Nurse Kristan indicated that she had taken the resident's vital signs and completed a neurological evaluation at 7.20 a.m. Meaning, the patient already died 7.17, but you still have on your documentation at 7.20 or 3 minutes after she passed away that you still have a proper vital signs and a proper neurological assessment. So that, my friend, is what we call back in the Philippines, advanced charting. Here in the U.S., we call it false documentation. And that is illegal. I get that we nurses have a lot of things on our plate. So most of the time, we have to improvise and uh, work with whatever we have to do and prioritize whatever we need to do. And most of the time, we do everything in the bedside first, after which, after a few hours, then we go with the documentation part. So ask yourself, have you ever committed a false documentation in your life? No? Are you sure? Small petty things, uh, like for example, have you ever done your hourly rounds and really actually check if the patient is actually breathing or if the patient is actually like turned on this particular side or you know if the patient is actually lying on bed or whatever, particularly for those working the night shift. It's really hard to do these things because it's uh, like weighing things between uh, checking the patients versus the patient's comfort. Or have you ever asked the patients if they want to go to the bathroom with a particular R or if they have peed or they have sold their uh, diapers or pull-ups? So those kind of things. But for something as important as a neurological assessment, particularly for a patient who fell and had a head injury, that is a big no-no. No, no, no. Rude. <laughs> but you also have to consider the nurse's position. She is actually an LPN, licensed practical nurse, and most of the time, they are not allowed to do this kind of assessment. Yep, even in my facility, if I am working with someone who's like LPN and they're taking the same number of patients that I have, sometimes I have to do their assessment for them. It's like I have eight patients, they have eight patients, so I have to look out some of the patients that have to be done like initial assessment because I have to do it because I have the license as a registered nurse. They will most likely ask my help to do that for them. But it is a non-medical surgical unit. And like I said, different facilities have different rulings. Then, in some instances also, sometimes in a medical surgical unit, when we had to transfer back the nursing home patients to their facility, in the night shift, we're not allowed to do it. Because sometimes they don't have an RN present during that night shift. Most of the time, LPNs uh, usually work in the nights and the RNs who has the license works in the daytime. So sometimes we have to wait for the morning shift in order for those patients to be transferred. But like I said, it depends from facility to facility. Then on further investigation, Nurse Ganey admitted to the nursing or assistant nursing director that she had not completed the 7.20 a.m. neurological evaluation and that she had falsified the documentation. In further review, Nurse Ganey indicated that the remaining neurological evaluations had been completed as documented. So that's what she said. She claimed that she falsified the 720, but she did everything else. Like uh, whatever she documented there, she has done that properly. But as per the observation of the facility's camera footage, revealed that following the patient's transfer to the lobby at 11.44 p.m. until 7 a.m., a period of seven hours, Nurse Ganey had not completed any of the seven scheduled neurological examinations. So she claimed that she did everything else except the 720, but as per the camera, she missed seven of those evaluations or assessments. So you can't lie about it because the camera has timestamps. So if you said you'd done this uh, assessment during this time, but on the camera it says that you never been even close to the patient. So there's no way for you of doing that. So as per the fall policy, after a patient falls every 15 minutes for the first hour, then every hour for the next three hours, and every two hours for the next four hours, then every four hours for the next 16 hours, and every eight hours for the next uh, 48 hours. So that's their protocol. So from the policies A, B, C, she missed seven assessments on those uh, particular parts. So that's a big, big no-no. But can you blame her? If you have 39 patients, do you think you can give that uh, specific number of attention for this particular patient while taking care of the other patients? So that's one thing that's really controversial about this because is, is it really right for you to have that kind of number of patients 
while having these kind of conditions. Why wasn't a patient asked to be brought to the uh, ER or emergency department? Uh, Nurse Ganey actually informed the physician or the on-call physician. Uh, she tried to call around 12 to 12.15 in the morning approximately. But the on-call physician called back and gave the orders at 2.30 in the morning. So 11.30, the doctor just responded at 2.30 a.m. So approximately three hours after, at which point the physician or the on-call physician has spoken to the uh, resident's nurse or the patient's nurse and told her to continue monitoring the resident's neurological checks. So that's her advice or that's his advice. Meaning, Nurse Ganey has informed the physician, but I'm not sure actually or the report says anything what uh, Nurse Ganey told the physician about uh, the patient's conditions or with regards to the resident's neurological checks, given that she actually didn't do most of the checks. So I'm not sure what she really said uh, that made the physician tell her just to keep monitoring the neurological checks. Nevertheless, the physician should have uh, just sent the patient to the emergency department because the patient had a head trauma and there was no RN available during that shift. So it's actually best for them to bring the patient to the ED. Uh, but someone claims that uh, since the patient's actually new in that facility, if they send back the patient, they will lose money. Oh. As per one of the nurses who I asked, they have to be there at least 30 days before they can send them back to the hospitals for a, for a checkup or readmissions. If they've done it before that, they will lose some money or they will not able to get the money, a big portion out of it. Again, if the LPN did her job on doing the proper neurological assessment, which I'm not sure if she is capable, then she could have or might have find out something that could lead to the uh, need for sending the patient to the hospital. Then again, patient had a history of CBA and has uh, expressed their fascia. So it's very difficult for the nurse or the LPN to do her assessment. Then again, if the LPN actually did the assessment, she could have found out if the patient is actually being more drowsy or being more lethargic. So she could have prevented that from happening. So like I said, this is a complicated case. Then going back to the story, at 7.15 a.m., uh, the day shift uh, E20 or the staff coordinator so the patient was unresponsive and was not arousable. So they decided to transfer the patient from the reclining going to the wheelchair. Then one of the staff actually asked Nurse Ganey, what is the patient's code status? So they did ask that question, which she actually never answered and just proceeded from moving the patient or the resident back to his room. Then for investigation, uh, none of the employees had attempted to call 911 to secure emergency medical treatment for the resident or contact the nursing supervisor or medical staff for further assistance. And it was also documented or was caught on the camera that no one started a CPR during the time they found the patient unresponsive. Bruh. We were taught in nursing school, if you found someone unresponsive, we have to proceed from doing your BLS training or whatever you learn in your BLS training. Uh, check for pulse, check for breathing, then proceed to CPR if deemed necessary. That is very, very basic, right? Unless the patient has a DNR or DNI status. I think it's safe to say that I think Nurse Ganey or Nurse Kristan didn't know what's the patient's code status. Because if she did, she would have actually started the CPR as soon as they found him unresponsive on the reclining chair. So for those coming here to the United States, knowing the patient's code status is really, really, really important, particularly on the start of your shift. Uh, during hand of report or endorsement, this is one of the basic things I have to know if the patient uh, is DNI, DNR, or a full code status. So you have to know those things. If ever a nurse gain a scenario wherein she doesn't know the code status, it's best for her to go to the med records and look up and check what's the patient's code status on those documentations in order for them to see if they need to start the CPR or not. But as per my colleague who works in a nursing home, she said, per policy, if they did not witness the arrest, even if the patient is a code one or a full code, they don't do a CPR. So you definitely have to check your policy about these things because like I said, different facilities have different uh, procedures or SOPs. So you have to know them. So maybe Nurse Ganey uh, thought that this kind of uh, policy is applicable to that facility where the patient died. But as per investigation, it's not. Then as per interview with the Philadelphia Police Department, it revealed that the coroner had listed the resident's cause of death as blunt force trauma. So, there you go. 
the fall really killed that patient. But like I said earlier, uh, there's three of them versus 39 patients. So what was the nursing aide doing then? As per facilities camera, it revealed that the nursing aide assigned to this patient had not toileted the patient or provided assistance to use the bathroom throughout the night nor had the employee check with the resident or the patient to see if there was anything the patient needs or wanted uh, during the course of the night. So there you go. Uh, here in our facility, normally you have to go to check your patients at least every two hours. It's like uh, one hour for the nurse and the other hour is for the nursing aide. We do it alternatively every hour. That's how we do it in medical surgical unit. So I think for nursing home patients, you actually have to do that as well. Uh, maybe every two hours at least, just to check with them if they needed something. So as per the camera, none of this happened. So the nursing aide never actually checked with the patient for a few hours just to check if the patient is actually in need or something or if the patient is actually breathing. Then upon for investigation, the afternoon uh, at 4.40 p.m., it revealed that upon transferring the patient to the bed, they noted the patient was heavily saturated with urine and feces. So there you go. Uh, patient has been pooping, has been peeing on his diaper, and the CNA did not do anything to help with this uh, kind of need for that particular patient. Employee further indicated that employee E15 or the nursing aide assigned to that patient had never completed the rounds or the process of checking of the well-being of the resident assigned to you. So here is safe to say that the nursing aide has not provided the proper care for this patient, which I think would have prevented because if she actually did her rounds, like at least two hourly or a few hours uh, rounds just to check on the patient, she might have actually caught that the patient was not feeling well. Or during if you tried to change the linens or the patient's uh, soiled pants or pull-ups or underpants, then you will notice the patient has, might not be responsive as he was earlier. If she actually did her job, she might have actually saw like a big difference for that. Then thus, she could have reported to Nurse Gini. So on this scenario, both the nursing aide and the LPN did not do their job on taking care of this patient. Particularly on a patient who had fall, you have to give a lot of attention for someone who had a fall, especially if they hit their head. So you have to check on them every few hours as much as you can to ensure that patient is actually doing better or is still stable. Because having a head trauma is something big that you really have to monitor. Then another thing, further investigation during the course of the day wherein the patient was still alive should have received an enteral or liquid nutrition provided through a tube inserted into the stomach from abdomen. So I think it's like a peg tube uh, inserted. Basically, the patient should have been receiving a continuous enteral feeding throughout the course, but wasn't being given throughout the shift. So that's one of the things they found out also. It should have been started at 2 p.m. and this continued at 6 in the morning every day. So, but knowing the patient's condition wherein he keeps on trying to stand up and fall, so I think it's safe to say that it's hard to keep those things attached to the patient. Yes, and it's like prone for them to pull those things out. So maybe that's one of the reasons why they weren't able to start the feed or continue or start back on an enteral feeding the patient needs. As per the clinical record, it revealed that there's no documentation, again, no documentation from E14 or employee 14 or the LPN or nurse gainee regarding the details of the resident's fall, descriptions of the resident's injuries, and or documentation of any necessary care or treatments provided to the resident as a result of the fall. It's like, huh? Uh, your patient fell and died and you didn't even document anything about this. So again, that's a big, big, big. Okay, so protect yourself. Then the review of the full investigation analysis sheet revealed that E6 or employee E6, the registered nurse and the night shift supervisor had indicated that at the time of the fall, the resident's bed had been the lowest position and the resident was wearing a socks at the time of the fall. So that's very basic for most of the places where you have to put the bed low and let the patients wear a non-slip socks in order for them to prevent from falling down. But as per interview on one of the employees who was present during the time the patient was transferred, it was found out that the patient's bed was on high position. And the employee stated that the staff had to move the resident carefully. There was glass on the floor and the resident did not have socks on his feet. So I 
think the registered nurse and the supervisor are kind of trying to cover up for this uh, for the LPN's uh, shortcomings or the facilities shortcomings. So as per investigations, it goes against each other. You also have to think about uh, Nurse Ginny because here she's actually a travel nurse, meaning she might have not have worked there for a long time. She might have just been there just to fill up for someone. So she might have not have known any of the residents. That could have been a factor for that scenario. Uh, because most of the travel nurse, if you wanted to work as a travel nurse here in the United States, most of the training that you will have in a facility will be maximum maybe two or three days. This is the maximums I have heard. But most of the time, it's either a few hours or just a half the shift or maybe one shift. So there's really a tendency for you to have some errors and not to know all the policy within the span or within the time frame. Because there's a lot of things to know. So if you wanted to be a travel nurse, make sure you are capable of adjusting as soon as you can uh, in order to provide safety for the patient and for your license as well. Negligence or neglect really transpired during the course where the patient actually died. Neglect coming from the LPN, from Nurse Ganey, and a neglect coming from the nurse maid. So both of them are actually not working in that facility anymore. They got fired. But as per the management, I think they do have some issues on their side as well. Uh, having 1 to 39 patients, they said that might be a cause for having an unsafe ratio. But for nursing home patients, this is actually uh, like typical for them. Having like 1 to 25 to 30 to 40 patients. Uh, but... Uh, don't think there's a mandate for that particular state on the proper ratio for nursing home patients versus uh, nurses. So that's one issue. Then training period. I think for travel nurses or nurses who are going to take care of, of patients, uh, especially these kind of patients who have like a long history, they should have more uh, longer training period in order for these patients to be taken care of properly. Then as per protocols, they should have uh, educated their staff about what things to do or how things are to be done during this kind of scenarios so everyone should know what their policy is particularly this kind of scenarios or emergency scenarios another thing about the management i think uh, the doctor could have just sent the patient to the ed if they could uh, but like i said uh, conspiracy things they're saying it was something to about the money so i don't know for nurse Ganey, she was actually charged for involuntary manslaughter reckless endangerment, and related offenses. But she was offered a plea bargain agreement wherein if she pled guilty, we will drop in the case for the involuntary manslaughter and the felon in me. As per the Attorney General's office, she was sentenced to six months under house arrest with another four years of probation. And that's according to court records. Ganey will also be barred from seeking reinstatement of her license or working in a care facility during those times so for me i really believe there's a mixture of issues coming from the management side and from the nurses who take care of them both the lpn and the nursing aid if they could have done their work properly i think the patient could have been saved or could have been brought to the emergency department and these lawsuits could have been prevented uh, then again the management has their size for having these issues also if they had a proper procedures for this and allowed not to have this like kind of falls or could have have preventive measures in order to prevent the patients from falling down, all of this could have been prevented. So yeah, so it's a mixture of uh, neglect from all sides. So like I said, this is a complicated case and this is a controversial case here in the United States. So I hope you guys learned something from this video, particularly those nurses coming here to the United States and will be working in the nursing home setting. So you definitely have to get your uh, research going on to know how big a difference is having to work in a nursing home facility. Uh, they have their own world, own policy, and different weird kind of settings or SOPs. So you have to know all of them. Comment down below on what do you think about this case. Put in if it's similar to your facilities back home in or whichever country you're working in. It's quite interesting to know these kind of things. So please feel free to write it down, okay? So if you like this video, please click the like button, subscribe button, and please share your friends. So again, I'm Nurse Juan de la Cruz, your RFW nurse. Thank you for watching. God bless. Bye-bye. Stay safe.